I'm uh, completely with you. I think it's a noble endeavor. It's something that you've got to do. So um, anything that I can do to help support you, I will certainly undertake to do. And except going on Facebook. I don't do Facebook, okay? So I just don't do it. Um, I don't Twitter. I don't tweet either. So I'm, I'm a Neanderthal. Um, so should I go now? Yeah, yeah, you can. So um, I'm going to talk about why the hard problem is especially supposed to be especially hard. Now, I'm going to I'm going to say a lot of things that express my feelings about philosophy, but um, as my old um, uh, Compare, my old friend Charlie Martin, C.B. Martin, used to say, philosophy is done down here, pointing to his belly, his stomach, not up here, okay? You've got to feel it. You've got to, it's, got to, it's got to move you or uh, it's no good at all, okay? So what makes philosophy hard is not for the reasons you might think if you study philosophy in an academic setting, or you have all these complicated arguments all this technical um, vocabulary and so on, okay? These are tools. These are tools that people use. And the problem is the tools take on a life of their own. So the people start focusing on the tools rather than what they're designed to help us understand. Um, now, you can be good at using these tools without being a good philosopher. And I think that uh, philosophy is like art. Philosophy is not philosophy. Okay? And because of that, there's a corollary to that. And it is that... Most philosophers are not philosophers. Okay? I'll come back to this later. Uh, there are a lot of famous people that have made a big name for themselves in philosophy that I think are, um, are not philosophers. They're very good, they're smart, uh, but they're not philosophers. They don't have it, they haven't been really engaged in a visceral way with the material. Okay? Now, I'm going to talk a, a bit about Wilfred Sellers, who in the 1960s... Can I interrupt you? Sorry. Yes. A little. People are still messaging us that about your sound. Uh, I think it is... Uh, when your voices get high, it becomes... It starts to buzz. If you could... Uh, it's, this terrible, it's this terrible system that I have. If, I think we could try uh, a bit. You are a bit closer, I think, to the microphone. If you are, if you be a little back, I think it, it could be better. So I was trying to get closer to it. Okay. So is that better? <laughs> it sounds the same. Yeah. It's way better now, actually. Oh, it is. Thank you. Well, I'll just wave my hands a lot and you can understand what I'm saying from looking at my looking at my body language. All right. In the 1960s, the philosopher Wilfred Sellers talked about a distinction between the manifest image, the appearances, and the scientific image, okay? The manifest image is the, uh, the way we experience the universe in everyday life and in laboratories when we're doing physics. So we, we look at meters, we uh, look at computer screens, we sit at tables, we do all these things. We're living in the manifest image. The scientific image is the image you get from basically physics, okay? And the problem is these two images, the, the way things appear to us and the way physics tells us they are, don't fit together very well. 
So take my tomato. This is a tomato, okay? Grown right here in Missouri. And uh, we know about this tomato, we engage with it. It's roughly spherical, sort of. It's more, more spher spherical if I do it that way. Roughly spherical, it's red, it's juicy, it's, it has a certain smell. It doesn't smell very strong, but it does have a smell and all those things. When we turn to physics, we find that it's made up of quarks and leptons, say. And they aren't red, they aren't round, they don't smell any way, they don't feel any way, taste any way. Uh, or maybe it's made up of uh, energy concentrations and fields or something like that, okay? So the question is, how do those fit together? How can we fit together what we experience, the way we experience the world, and uh, what the sciences tell us the world is actually like. Do they go? Now, there are standard responses to this question. One is idealism or instrumentalism that says, look, the scientific image is just a construct. It's something we use to get around the world in, but it's not to be taken literally. Okay, so when we talk about electrons, and when we talk about particles, we're just talking in a way that enables us to manipulate the appearances, okay? So that's one view. So one view is what's real is the manifest image. The scientific image is merely a construct. The other, uh, the other view, another view is that's, it's the, that's the wrong way around. The manifest image that the way we experience the tomato is just an illusion, okay? The tomato isn't red. It isn't really anything like the, the familiar one that we buy in the um, vegetable stand. Uh, and uh, so that's another response to the, the question, how are the manifest and scientific images uh, related, okay? Now, uh, there is a third, there's another, a fourth, I guess, uh, way of talking about the relationship between the appearances and reality that's relatively new. And that is that reality actually is structured in a hierarchy. So you have at the fundamental level, physics, okay? Physics tells us about the fundamental level. And then chemistry tells us about the next highest, higher level. And then we've got biology on top of, on top of chemistry. And we have psychology on top of biology. And we have um, sociology or anthropology on top of psychology and so on. So we, reality actually, all these, uh, the descriptions that we get in the manifest image uh, the uh, descriptions that we deploy in everyday experience and in our scientific laboratories describe a higher level of reality than that described by physics. The higher level depends on what happens at the physical level, but it's not, it can't be reduced to it in any way. It's, it's independent in a certain way. It is um, um, autonomous as people like to say. Uh, now, I'm gonna talk a bit about the hard problem of con consciousness and um, what makes, what, why philosophers think it is such a hard problem, okay? So I agree, I'm not gonna argue that understanding consciousness is easy. It's something that we can do in a half an hour. But I wanna say, the tomato is the same way. <laughs> try to understand the tomatoes. Try to understand how you get something like this from a bunch of quarks and electrons or from energy distributions and fields or something like that. Try to explain that. Why, why don't we obsess over that? How does that work? Okay. Now, what most philosophers, philosophers will tell you is, oh, well, it obviously works, right? So why should we worry about it? We don't have a tomato problem here, right? Uh, but consciousness, that's different, okay? Now, um, let me say that 
most of what I'm going to be saying in the next couple of min few minutes is um, to try to get you to feel why uh, philosophers have thought consciousness is mysterious. And I'm going to start, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of this problem. Um, and uh, I feel a little bit guilty about this because I feel as though I'm putting you into the fly bottle. You know, Wittgenstein talked, I'm not a Wittgensteinian, by the way, but he had some nice uh, examples. Uh, Wittgenstein talked about the fly in the fly bottle, and philosophy is like the fly in the fly bottle. The fly bottle is like a, a, a tube, a, um, a test tube, a, a glass tube that's open at one end, and the fly, I can't see, flies in and keeps trying to get out at that end. Now, um, I studied briefly under Norman Malcolm, who was a student of Wittgenstein's, and he used to describe this philosophers in the fly bottle as, yes, the fly just beats its head against the end of the bottle until it's all bloody. <laughs> philosophers are quite, are quite um, uh, aggressive, but nevertheless, uh, that's the idea. Now, the the what I want to suggest is what makes the hard problem especially hard is that we are taking on board some assumptions that are completely optional, that and uh, are probably um, largely responsible for our being in this predicament, our being in uh, the fly bottle. Now, the the. The interesting thing is about consciousness is, and I'm going to give you one more adage here. Um, um, I have to get ready for it. People talk about consciousness. Philosophers aren't the only philosophers. So scientists get up and, and make claims about conscious experience and neuroscientists talk about the brain as being the substrate of consciousness and consciousness arises from neural processes and so on. But when they talk that way, they're talking as though they were philosophers. They're making a, a kind of philosophical assessment of the situation. And we should not take them to be talking as scientists. They don't get that from science. They get it because they know enough philosophy to be dangerous, okay? <laughs> okay, so how did consciousness become so mysterious? Okay, let's start with Descartes. So high tech. Now, Descartes, Descartes' metaphysics was a metaphysics of substances, attributes, and modes. A substance is something that has properties. An attribute is not a property. Many people who read Descartes and read Leibniz, uh, read when they talk about attributes, they think they're talking about properties. They're not. For them, properties are modes, OK? An attribute is the what the substance is. So for Descartes, I'm going to uh, put God to one side because God was one sort of substance. But when we're talking about us here and now, there are two kinds of substance. There are extended substances. So substances that are extended, OK? They're extended substance. And they're thinking substances. And by thinking, Descartes thinking of conscious thinking, the kind of thinking you engage in when you're consciously aware of it. Okay, So we have thinking substances and extended substances. Modes are properties. And a mode of an extended substance is a way of being extended. Okay, So the tomato is round. That's, a, or let's say, roughly spherical. That's a one way of being extended, OK? Uh, and Descartes thought that um, all the uh, uh, extended substances and mental substances or thinking substances were different kinds of substance, OK? So 
he's thinking that um, minds and bodies, or minds and brains, Descartes knew quite a bit about brains, are distinct, belong to a distinct uh, category of being. The bodies are extended, minds are not extended, uh, minds think, bodies don't think, okay? Right? Now, I want to say that Descartes' legacy is making this distinction, making the distinction between the mental and the physical, making that a real distinction so that in effect, mental means non-physical and physical means non-mental, okay? Now, this is one of the cases in which we bifurcate the world, we divide things up into two and then spend uh, the rest of our lives trying to get them back together, trying to figure out how to get them back together. What's important is to understand why we did this in the first place, why we, we bifurcated things like this in the first place. Descartes had his reasons that we no longer share, but there's a, a phenomenon called belief perseverance. So beliefs persevere. And what you psychologists have found is that once someone forms a belief about something on the basis of evidence and then comes to see that the evidence was no good, the belief, belief stays in there, it perseveres. So belief perseverance. And once Descartes stepped the tone, once you say uh, the me me mental properties are distinct from physical properties, okay, you're gone, you're in the fly bottle, all right, you're already in there. Uh, now, so the, the question now is, how could something physical be mental? How could we get these back together? Well, the first one attempt to this, to do this, was the identity theory. So in the 1950s, the late 1950s, JJC Smart and UT Place published papers on the identity theory of mind. And that, that what they said essentially was that minds are brains, okay? Uh, and there was a lot of blowback to that. So people said, well, how could brains, you know, have conscious experiences and so on. But the major um, criticism of the identity theory of uh, was functionalism. <laughs> Um, now, what functionalism says is that um, when you're in pain, for example, this is not a physical thing, okay? But it's not a non-physical thing either. To be in pain is to be in a state that plays the pain role. You're in some state or other that is caused by damage to tissue or excess pressure or heat or something like that. And it gives rise to um, you are wanting to, you know, get rid of it in some way and so on. So we have a functional account of what a pain is. All right. Uh, something that pl pays, plays the pain role. Okay. Now, one apparent difficulty of this with this is it does seem not to and it, it seems to leave out the painfulness of pain. If you say that a pain state is just a state that plays the pain role, where is the painfulness of the state? And so on, okay? Now, one thing that it's really important to understand about functionalism is that what functionalism said was, you've got a physical state here, okay? And it plays the pain role. So it causes your behavior, your aversive behavior, the behavior you engage in when you're in pain, okay? It brings about that and it is caused by other physical states, okay? So it's, we're talking here at the physical level. But functionalist said, that's not the pain, okay? That isn't the pain. To be in pain is to be is to have the property of being in a state that plays the pain role. So the pain is actually a higher order or higher level property. 
It's a mental property, okay? It's a higher order. It's not, it's not a Cartesian property. It's a property that you're in by virtue of being in this physical state, but it's not the physical state. And the argument for that was that many different kinds of physical states could play the pain role, okay? So pain is multiply realizable, right? That was the idea. And uh, when you're, when we say that you're being in pain causes you to believe that you're in pain, to want to um, uh, do something about it and so on, uh, that now becomes very puzzling because um, this too, this state too is realized by some physical state, okay? So actually this, doesn't cause this. So, okay. Uh, well, maybe this causes this. Okay, maybe the, your, your, your being in pain, your, your pain state as opposed to your physical state causes this other physical state. Well, how does that work? That looks like we have something that's not physical or something that's, that is at a higher level intervening in the causal situation here. So we get rid of that, and now we have a problem, okay? We have the problem of mental causation. How is this supposed to work? We like to think that our mental states, and in fact, functionalism started with the idea that mental states can be given this causal analysis, this functional analysis, but now it turns out they don't actually do anything. I mean, Frank Jackson says somewhere, it's amazing that people think these things actually do anything. And then you think, well, wait a minute. You just told me that what it is to be in pain is to be in a state, and blah, 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 blah. And Jackson says, sorry, uh, it doesn't do anything. So we have the problem of mental causation. Uh, now, notice that the problem of mental causation set up like this is completely dependent on this functionalist picture, this idea that mental states, states of mind, psychological states, psychological properties are higher, higher order, or higher level properties, okay? And once you say that, they can't play the pain. They uh, have no causal role themselves. This is the thing that has the causal role. So why not make the obvious move as David Lewis and David Armstrong did and say, actually, the pain is that, okay? So Armstrong and Lewis had a version of functionalism in which they said, that's the pain, okay? And now we have the hard problem. How could that be the pain, okay? How can this thing be, have the qualities of a conscious experience, okay? And now we have the mystery. How can we get the qualities of conscious experience? How can we reconcile those with the qualities and the powers and so on of, of the brain state? Can you, can you hear me at all? Am I making any sense? We can hear you, but it's a little metallic noise. Uh, and sometimes, but I can understand you. <laughs> it's a bit distracting, but I think it's- uh, I'm so sorry. I saw that my new laptop would be fine, but I could not get it to function on our network. There's some, there's some setting that's not working with it. So I spent half an hour uh, you before- You could try the first microphone you- uh, Try the other had, microphone? You said you had two microphones. And well, now the other one is the built-in microphone, and I'm not even sure I just have this blob here. <laughs> you have a headphone? Oh, I have a headphone, yeah. But it doesn't. Oh, so if you use AirPods, can I use those for sound? Uh, that would be great, I think. Ah, I thought of that. I was giving these as a present, and I, I've only used them once before. Ah, 
if this works, okay. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Is that better? It's the same. I thought I turned on the. Maybe you can change the input source of your microphone from the Zoom settings. That's what I'm doing. And it says my AirPods. It's, it's saying that it's, it is my AirPods. So still terrible? Mm, not terrible, but <laughs> a bit distracting. But they say it's better. Yeah, I guess it's better also. Yeah. I can really understand what you said, and I can just you follow through them, so. the words. OK, I forgot where I was. <laughs> I forgot where I was. OK, so the, um, the question is, if we, if we dispense with this picture and try to say that this is the pain, or this is the experience of pain, or whatever, how do we? How can we account for its qualitative nature? Because the qualitative nature of this is nothing like a pain. Okay, nothing like pains. And this is where you hear people, including scientists, talk about the brain as being the neural substrate of consciousness. Okay, well that's just a weaselly word. That's just so people talk about consciousness arising from the brain or a product of the brain. So what's that? Okay, what, what are they talking about when they're saying that? They're just waving their hands to tell you the truth. And one way that philosophy works is if you're, if you're a philosophy student, you might be puzzled by something that someone says, but eventually you realize, well, other people say the same thing, so they must be right, and you start saying it as well. You don't challenge it anymore, okay? But we should start challenging these things. If David Chalmers says consciousness arises from uh, neural processes and so on, how, uh, how, what is, what's that supposed to be? And why say that, okay? Why exactly say that? All right, so now I'm gonna say a few things about uh, the uh, getting around the problem, getting us out of the flow bottle, okay? And uh, then we can, you can ask me anything, you, almost anything you want to, assuming you can hear my answer. Okay, so first of all, I talked about, I talked about bifurcating the universe. One thing that philosophers have done is say, qualities are one thing and powers are another thing. Okay, qualities are qualitative and powers give um, force to objects and so on, uh, uh, enable those objects to behave in a particular way. And in fact, some philosophers have argued that um, qualities are, are mental, that physical things are just things that have causal powers. Their nature is exhausted by their causal powers. They have no qualitative nature. So you hear people say, so what are the qualities of an electron? Tell me what the qualities of an electron are. Well, you know, an electron is unobservable. So we're not gonna observe any qualities. All we can observe are its effects on anything else. It doesn't follow from that, that it doesn't have qualities, okay? so. Once we split off qualities and powers, we're back with the functionalist picture. We've got the things doing the causal work, and then we've got the quality bearers, okay? Uh, and the other, the other bifurcation is between mental and physical. We start off with the assumption that mental properties and physical properties are distinct, okay? And now we go to work, okay? But that's where 
that's what that puts us in the fly bottle. Another example that Wittgenstein uses is you're watching a magician, a conjurer, who's going to pull a rabbit out of a hat, okay? And you watch him very carefully, okay? And Wittgenstein says it was the very move that we thought was most innocent that got the rabbit into the hat. So the magician does all sorts of things that result in the rabbits getting into the hat. And those are distractions. We don't see the magician putting the rabbit in the hat because we think he's just doing something innocent. And that's the way that's the way this problem works. The the in it, the the once you make once you bifurcate qualities and powers and the mental and the physical, you're in the fly bottle. Okay, the rabbit's already in the hat. All right. So how could how could um and we can go back to, uh, well, actually, I won't do that. We could, so how could a state of the brain be a conscious state? As Colin again says, how can you get consciousness, technicolor consciousness, so technicolor, highly colorful consciousness from soggy gray matter, okay? So, Imagine that uh, you are undergoing an experience of the tomato. Okay, so you're having this experience of this round, red, pungent thing. Okay, and the sci a scientist is observing your brain. Okay, well, your scientist doesn't see anything round or red in there. Okay, um, so why do you think that your brain state could be your conscious state? Okay. Well, look, you are observing a tomato. The scientist is observing a brain state, your experience of a tomato, okay? So we've got two things here. We've got the tomato and we've got the experience of a tomato, okay? Two things, two different things. Now, why I think that the properties, the qualities of an experience should resemble the qualities of what's being experienced, okay? Now, way right back in the 50s, Place, UT Place, pointed out something that he called the phenomenological fallacy. And that's the fallacy of mistaking properties of objects that are being experienced for properties of the experience, okay? So when you experience something, you're experiencing it. The tomato is round and red. Your experience isn't round and red, okay? What does an experience look like? Well, why should we think that the, the experience of a tomato should look anything at all like a tomato? Why should we think that we could somehow deduce uh, what the experience of a tomato is like a description of your brain states, right? So notice that you are in the state. You are undergoing the experience. And undergoing an experience is different from ob observing or undergoing an experience of an experience, all right? So there's no, there's no immediate link between what you're experiencing and what the... Um, what the um, experience, what I'm experiencing when I observe your brain states. And let's say for the sake of argument, your brain states are your experiences, right? Okay. So I ha there's a lot more to be um, said about this. But if you go back to the, the bifurcation business, suppose we thought Suppose you thought, as I think, that qualities are powers, but this distinction is a distinction of conception only. It's a different way of thinking about one and the same thing. So again, think about the tomato. It has the quality of being roughly spherical. And because it has that quality, it will roll. It has the power to roll. It has the, qu the quality of being red. And because it has that quality, 
It has the power to reflect light in a particular way so as to look red, okay? So why not, why, why make this a divide? Instead of saying this is a real distinction, let's say it's a conceptual distinction. And we can say the same thing, we, we might well say the same thing about the mental and the physical. So back in the 1980s, Donald Davidson argued that the distinction between me the mental and the physical was one of conception only. Something is mental or physical only as described. Davidson's view was the only way we can account for um, beliefs and desires and so on is by assuming that when I have a belief, the state I'm in could be given a physical description. I doesn't mean you could, I could say what that physical description is going to be, but if, if, a mental, if a mental term is true of me, then some physical term is true of me, okay? Even though there's not a conceptual connection here, they're conceptually in different arenas, but they, they refer to one and the same thing. Davidson said that's the only way we can account for our talk about beliefs and desires and intentions and meanings and so on, okay? So um, if we can, and the tragedy is Davidson was misunderstood, okay? So people said, well, uh, when a mental state causes a, um, your, uh, you to move your body, did it, did it cause it because it was mental or because it was physical? And Davidson never understood the question because it missed the point. It, it, something is mental only as described. It doesn't cause it because it's described mentally, okay? It causes it because of its physical nature, right? So anyway, um, don't get me going on uh, misreadings of Davidson, okay? So now I'm almost done. Uh, uh, if we go back and look at functionalism, functionalism started out with the idea that something is a pain, say, because it plays the pain role, okay? Suppose you turn that around and say that something plays the pain role because it's painful. <laughs> you know, you're in a certain state that is painful, and no wonder that state plays the pain role, okay? Now, is um, consciousness still mysterious? Yeah, but so is the tomato, okay? It's just as mysterious as the tomato. How do you get a tomato out of the stuff that physics tells us it's made of, right? How do you get a human body out of that, for example, or anything else, right? So there is a problem here, right? But we, we shouldn't make it harder than it is. I mean, if we start talking about... Um, Tomato's redness being a functional property that's a higher order property of the tomato, we're going to get the, same, the problem going over into the tomato, but the motivation would be exactly the same. So what I'm suggesting here is the, the, the hard problem of consciousness, what makes consciousness mysterious is a bunch of background assumptions that we make that put us into the fly bottle, that make the problem much harder than it is. D don't get me wrong, I haven't said, I haven't explained about anything much about consciousness. But what I've, what I've tried to do is suggest that the problem of how you get conscious experiences from neurological goings on is no different, no different than the problem of how you get a tomato from those other things, okay? The, um, okay. And I stop there and thank you for being patient. And I hope this audio was a little slightly better. Thank you.